everyone welcome back to my channel happy to have you here again if you're new welcome so today I'm gonna to be following up on my last video and telling you what we know since my last video on Gabby Petito I know it has taken me quite a while to update and that's because for a while there it was changing so fast that I couldn't even keep up with it enough to produce a video like this but things have slowed down a bit enough for me to catch up and put together something that actually would make sense to all of you and honestly it's just been a huge challenge to follow a case like this that has breaking developments almost daily as you can imagine my video Videos take a long time to put together beforehand and also after it's filmed because the editing process on one of these just takes a while also as some of you may hear in my voice I have been pretty sick lately for yeah about three weeks now I'm pretty much over it now but my voice is still kind of scratchy and I'm a little congested which I'm sure you guys heard in the last video so I apologize in advance for that also I do have a new microphone so we will see how that goes you guys I have had a lot of technical issues with equipment for this channel equipment for my podcasts over the past month and I have tried several different mics and as a lot of you have heard there have been quite a few issues with my mic in the past couple of videos so this is something totally new I'm trying Let's hope it goes well. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I know it might take some getting used to having a mic on the screen, but I think this will be the best sound possible. I am recording this video on Sunday, September 10th with everything that we know so far, pretty much everything, everything I can fit into this video. But again, I just wanna say that it's possible some more information could come out before this is uploaded. If that's the case, I will be leaving a pinned comment with those updates. And obviously as time goes on, things in this case are gonna to continue to change. There's a lot we likely do not know now. As of today, there is no sign of Brian Laundry. He is still considered missing. But before I get into recent updates, new information, and the latest on the hunt for Brian Laundrie, I wanted to talk about Gabby's family. I cannot tell you how inspired I feel after hearing the latest press conference from Gabby's family. It was so moving. They are so impressive, so incredibly strong and thoughtful of others first. And it's so evident by the words that they said in this press conference. So I wanted to share some of that with you. Uh, we're just hoping that uh, through our tragedy uh, with losing Gabby, that in the future, that uh, some good can come out of it, that we can help other people that may be in a similar situation reach out to these other organizations that do similar things and find out what's missing. You know, what can we do to, to fill that void? What can we do to help people? And we're just hopeful that we're able to help people in the future. We can't let her name be taken in vain. We need, we need positive stuff, all right? So anything that we can do to bring that up and, and, and help people, that's what we want to do. I'm so proud of her for doing this, and we're going to keep it going. Like you said, keep the light going and um, help a lot of people if we can. I don't want to dismiss the ridiculously hard work that the FBI and law enforcement all around did, but social media has been amazing and very influential. And to be honest, it should continue for other people too. This, this same type of heightened awareness should be continued for everyone, everyone. I want to ask everyone to help all of the people that are missing and need help because it's not just Gabby that deserves that. As you can hear, they said thank you to everyone. Thank you to the police, to the FBI, to people who got this going initially. They thanked several nonprofits and foundations who have helped them. They also thanked people on social media for all of the support and you know general leads that have come in. And they talked about how important it is to them that more people get the attention that they have gotten regarding Gabby's case, the media coverage, the social media interest, just the overall amount of resources that have been brought into this case. And obviously they're so thankful for all of that, but it's clear to them, especially after talking and connecting with so many people, that this does not happen for everyone. And I think we all know that, we all see that. I can't tell you how often people will request I cover a certain case and I look it up and there is nothing. No media coverage, no press conferences, 
it's truly a problem. I hope that this family and the words that they are saying resonate with the media and with law enforcement. And what's so cool is this family is using their time of tragedy to start a foundation in Gabby's honor that will help other people in need of help in domestic violence situations, in missing persons cases. I think it's incredible how quick they moved with this foundation. It's called the Gabby Petito Foundation, and they have made it a top priority to get it going as quick as possible and start helping people right away. I think that's amazing. And so I have decided to donate $50,000 from my media company to the Gabby Petito Foundation because I am just in awe of this family. I am so inspired by them and I feel like they truly are going to help tons of other people and I can't wait to see what they do. I have full faith in this family and this foundation that that money will be put to excellent use. If you would also like to make a donation to the Gabby Petito Foundation, I will have the link to do so below. If you wanna keep up with what they're doing, you can follow them on Twitter at Gabs Foundation. I'll have that on the screen. It's G-A-B-B-S Foundation. They are also selling Justice for Gabby silicone or metal bracelets that can be purchased on their website. Joe Petito, her father, has summed up the mission for the foundation by saying, no one should have to find their own child. We are creating this foundation to give resources and guidance on bringing their children home. We are looking to help people in similar situations as Gabby. Also at the press conference, her family shared that they got several tattoos, each of them in her honor. Most of them were designed by Gabby herself. Yeah, these were tattoos that Gabby designed herself. She was an artist and... Um, I wanted to have her with me all the time. So we all... I feel it. This helps we all put them. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Gabby drew this one. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get into everything we know about the investigation surrounding Gabby's death and around Brian's disappearance. My last video was recorded on September 21st, and at that point, Brian was not considered a suspect in anything. He was considered a person of interest. At that point, they were searching the Carlton Reserve. That's where their search has been focused and they are still searching it to this day. And right before I recorded the last video, it was announced that Gabby's death was a homicide. I do suggest watching my first video before continuing with this or maybe re-watching it because this could get a little confusing to you. But since then, there have been several developments. First of all, we found out more about the Mexican restaurant that they went to in Jackson, which was called Mary Piglet's. So witnesses claim to see Gabby and Brian in the Mary Piglet's Tex-Mex restaurant in Jackson, Wyoming on August 27th, and those reports have now been confirmed. And as far as we know, this is the last confirmed sighting of Gabby. According to a witness who was at the restaurant, Brian had gotten into an argument with several of the female employees at the restaurant and he had stormed in and out of the building several times. And during all of this, Gabby was very upset. She was crying. For the majority of all of this, she had actually went outside and tried to get Brian to leave the restaurant. And this was actually the same day that those YouTubers captured the footage of their van in the Spread Creek dispersed camping area in Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And this was a huge tip, as we know, because on September 19th, Gabby's remains were found not too far from that spot. There have also been several updates about Brian's activity leading up to his disappearance. First of all, we found out that when Brian got back to Florida, he got a new cell phone. This was confirmed by their family's attorney, the Laundry family's attorney, who is Steven Bertolino. And he said that a phone was purchased on September 4th, 2021, and that Brian also opened an account with AT&T for that phone. He has said that this phone is not a burner phone, and he also said he left it behind with him before he decided to go hiking in the Carlton Reserve. The FBI has now seized the phone, obviously, and they also got the footage from surveillance cameras at the AT&T store. Now, according to a report by TMZ, so take this for what you will, witnesses said that Brian was with an older woman at the AT&T store on September 14th, and it was purchased as a burner phone. So, of course, this contradicts what the attorney is saying. No one really knows at this point. Of course, there has been plenty of speculation over this. Many believe that the woman with him at the AT&T store was Roberta Laundrie, his mother, 
or it could have been their family friend, Rose Davis. Apparently, Rose was supposed to meet up with Brian and Gabby in Yellowstone National Park during their road trip, but Gabby didn't call on Rose's birthday, August 29th, to finalize the plans. Of course, there has been a lot of speculation about everyone connected to the Laundry family at this point, and Rose Davis has definitely been someone that people are looking at, wondering if she could have been in the inner circle of all of this, but at this point, we do not know. There is no evidence for that. Plus, after more and more of that starts circulating, Rose actually did an interview. She claimed that Brian had exhibited controlling, jealous behavior in his relationship with Gabby. I do believe that their relationship, as they kept going on, was getting a little, yeah, problematic. I mean, just seemed like there was more and more arguments and everything she did. I feel like, you know, he thought was wrong. She claims that at one point, Brian actually stole Gabby's ID and wouldn't give it back so that the two of them, Rose and Gabby, couldn't go out for drinks that night. Well, we were supposed to go line dancing. It was ladies night. And her drive is about 30 minutes to me. And halfway there, she realized her uh, ID was missing. And so it caused a really big argument because Brian just didn't want her to go out. And... It was a jealousy issue. There have been other reports that Brian and his parents went to the AT&T store on September 14th. This is unconfirmed. Many people believe this could have been an attempt to set up a burner phone. Again, unconfirmed. However, September 14th was the day that Brian's parents originally said that he had left to go hiking in the Carlton Reserve. They have since changed this. On October 5th, Brian's attorney revealed that Brian actually went hiking in the Carlton Reserve on Monday, September 13th, not the 14th. And this has created a whole new timeline, which obviously I think we can all agree this is incredibly odd. If your child is missing, you're likely gonna know what day it is that they had left. Then we found out that a few days before this, on September 10th, and the day before Gabby was reported missing, the police were called to the Laundry family home twice. And we don't know much about this. We know that these weren't emergency calls. The police have redacted a lot of the information in the report and have noted problems settled for both calls. So I recorded September 21st. At that point, Brian was not a suspect officially in anything. That changed the following day, September 22nd. At this point, a federal arrest warrant was issued for Brian Laundry not for the murder of Gabby, but for bank fraud. Brian allegedly charged $1,000 to Gabby's debit card. These purchases violate a federal statute. Fraudulent production, use, or trafficking in counterfeit or unauthorized access devices, which was why then Brian was finally indicted by a federal jury. Like I said though, he is still not considered a suspect in her murder yet. They are still gathering all the evidence to be able to prove that in court, and it does take some time. But this warrant will allow them to arrest Brian and hold him if he's found until they're able to gather enough evidence for his involvement in the homicide. I know that this stuff can get really frustrating. It seems so obvious, but there is so much we don't know at this point, and they've gotta be careful about every move they make because it could affect a future trial. This warrant also allows the FBI to issue a red notice through Interpol, which alerts police worldwide about internationally wanted fugitives, if they have reason to believe that Brian fled the country. So since my last video, the manhunt for Brian Laundry, which now they can say manhunt, has continued and more people have gotten involved, including Dog the Bounty Hunter, which has been quite interesting to watch. If you don't know who Dog the Bounty Hunter is, he is a 68 year old named Dwayne Chapman. He's known as Dog the Bounty Hunter. He's got multiple TV shows he's been on for a long time and he's pretty well known. He stepped in on September 25th and he was quite confident in the beginning He's quieted down a little bit recently, but I don't know if that's because he's been asked to and he has something in the works. I'm really not sure, but I'm gonna tell you what I know about his whole process. So he first showed up right at the Laundry's house. That was where 
the news came from that dog the bounty hunter was on the case. He went right to the laundry's front door, went up there and knocked. And instead of answering the door, Roberta Laundry actually called 911. We just have the female from that 1020 call in on 911, reference the situation with the male. The occupants are requesting us to come up and just go ahead and go to the house and assist and just to keep the peace. But they're not requesting us to come up and just stay back and make sure that uh, everything's good. So the reason I went to Mr. Landry is because I carry a reputation with me. The reputation is he gives you a second chance. He gonna get you, but he gives you a second chance. I thought the dad would answer and talk, but I was very persistent without disturbing the peace and knocked a few times so they saw it was me. Well, yeah, they've got so much infrared. I mean, they're gonna catch him. You know, I, the only reason I, I would doubt if he's in the swamp is they've been hunting it really good, okay? You know, I don't think he went to New York or uh, there's been a couple rumors he might have, might have went to Mexico. I've been to Mexico. If he's down there wanted, a white boy that doesn't know Spanish, the cartel's gonna grab him for the reward. Well, now we work off leads. Somebody knows something. Dog has told their family that if they want help locating their son and they want to bring him in alive, that that is also his goal, and he's here to help them in any way he can to do that. Dog and his family members, including Lisa Chapman, who is his daughter, his wife Francie, and Francie's son Greg, are all working on the case, and Dog also has a lot of resources and a whole team down there established. Lisa also claimed that Roberta Laundry has a burner phone, and she said that she got this information from the FBI, and she's implied that Maybe Roberta is using this phone to communicate with her son while he's on the run. The media has, of course, questioned the FBI about this claim, and they did not confirm nor deny it. So we just don't know at this point. Of course, things have really locked down since the FBI got involved. The FBI is super tight-lipped. They work in a completely different way than the police. So information flow has stopped a lot. On September 27th, Lisa confirmed on Twitter that Dog had received a promising lead through his tip line on Brian's location. She also reminded the public that her sister, Barbara Katie, died when she was around Gabby's age. So for their family, this case is now personal. So this ended up being a huge lead and it really seemed like maybe they were close to finding it. The lead claimed that Brian was hiding out in Fort DeSoto Park and its surrounding islands. This park is about 75 miles from the Laundry family home. So Dog quickly pulled a search team together of about 10 to 12 hand-picked individuals, including former law enforcement, former Navy SEALs, and Marines. And they all went out to search. And an active police officer also joined the search. So that really confirmed that Dog is working together with law enforcement, which is really important because they kind of need each other. Dog as a bounty hunter is allowed to take anonymous tips. There's a lot of things that a bounty hunter can do that the police can't, but there's also a lot that law enforcement can do that a bounty hunter cannot do. I mean, he can't even make an arrest if he were to find Brian. They have to work together. Got a bunch of volunteers out here. Most of them former law enforcement or former Navy SEALs and Marines. Dog believes at one point, Brian went to a small island called Egmont Key, possibly in a kayak, and spent the night. Although he says nothing conclusive was found yet. This footage was taken by Fox News, and they also put out a statement that Dog did not ask them for the media attention, and that to them he appeared to be sincere and not worried about the publicity he was getting or making it some type of publicity stunt. But I know that people are very split on all of that. So Dog had a boat and ground crews to search the Fort DeSoto Park campground, which is 1,136 acres. And it's difficult because it's also five interconnected islands. But he says that this is the perfect spot for someone like Brian to hide. They said that according to the tips they had gotten, Brian's parents stayed in the park from September 1st through third and that they stayed in spot number one and then they went back to the park with brian and stayed in spot 15 from september 6th through 8th and he said that three people were seen on video coming into the park and only two left this was later clarified according to park records 
they found out that they did have a reservation at the campground for September 1st through 3rd, but Roberta Laundry had canceled it. There was a big question mark around the second period of time, but eventually, their attorney confirmed that Roberta, Chris, and Brian did stay overnight at Fort DeSoto Park from September 6th through 7th. And records show that Roberta did in fact check into the Fort DeSoto Park campground on September 6th. The security footage is not public. It has been turned over to investigators, but several witnesses also confirmed seeing the Laundry family on September 6th and 7th in Fort DeSoto Park. For example, Marcy and Kenny Newsom were visiting from Fort Myers, and they said that they camped right next to Brian's parents. They said that they didn't actually see or notice Brian while they were there, but they do believe after they've reviewed their family photos from the trip that Brian is in the background of one of their selfies. Photos from their trip also have a red truck and a trailer in the background of some of them. And it looks just like the one parked at the laundry's home. Also, they told the media that they vaguely remembered seeing the same vehicle and attached camper while he was in the park on these dates. Tons of tips have come into Dog's private designated tip line. He has confirmed that he has received thousands of tips. And it turns out that at the time that Dog received the Fort DeSoto tips, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office said that they were not searching the Fort DeSoto Park and were not aware of any confirmed sightings in this area. But Dog was confident that Brian was hiding out on the islands. There was a lot of discussion around, you know, was this something that law enforcement already knew? And Dog kind of blew the lid off of it, but it sounds like he was the one who got the tips and put that all together. And in addition to the boat and ground crews, he also contracted a private canine unit, the Peace River Canine Search and Rescue Team, and they have been helping in the search. These dogs are trained to track scent, the adrenaline of a human, not like a sock and find the guy. So these dogs are incredible. They went through all this. It took me an hour to go through it. it. took that dog five minutes. So that really helped. For the most part, Dog started focusing on Egmont Key. This is a small island where he believes that Brian went by kayak at some point and then spent the night. We don't know exactly why he thinks that, but that's what he's saying. Lisa Chapman, his daughter, also told the media that during the search, they located personal items that they believe belong to Brian Laundrie, but we have no idea what those items are. Their theory is that he hid on the islands during the day and then was only active at night after people went home. And his crew has spent time searching at night. They've used helicopters, checking after the police have stopped working. You know, he can really do whatever he wants. The following day, Dog also confirmed on social media that they had found a campsite and a fresh monster can out in the woods on the island. On October 1st, Dog and his wife, Francie, announced that their family was adding an additional $10,000 to the reward for information that leads to Brian's capture. The reward is now at $170,000 and counting with donations coming in from private donors at this point. I thought about making part of my donation to that reward fund, but I decided that at this point, I think it would be better used by their family to help others because this case has gotten so much attention because there's so many eyes on Brian and everything going on with the search for him that I believe there will only continue to be more donations in the future. And that's already a very high amount for a reward. Again, this would only go to someone if they brought in a lead that led to Brian's capture. So Dog continued to search the area towards the end of September and into the beginning of October. He tweeted out this. He said, the search has continued throughout the weekend on the islands off of the west coast of Florida. Hashtag justice for Gabby, hashtag Brian Laundry. His team is still asking the public to call in with any tips they have. So if you happen to know something, even if it seems insignificant, you know, get that either to dog or to the FBI as soon as you can. I will have all the information on how to do that in the description box. So of course, with so many eyes on this case, so many people following every bit of information that comes out, there have been a lot of theories 
online. In addition to all the rumors about Brian's mom getting a burner phone or Brian getting a burner phone, there are also claims that since he disappeared, there has been activity on his Instagram, but people have also looked at their Spotify account, Nomadic Static. People have also looked at his personal Spotify account and on one of his Spotify playlists, which was actually created sometime after Gabby went missing, was renamed from self-consumption to nomadic static while Brian was on the run. So as this case has continued to spread online, you know, continued media coverage and more and more people becoming interested in it, all the attention actually led to the discovery of another missing person. On September 28th, the body of 46-year-old Houston resident Bob Lowry was found in the Teton Pass, an area near where Gabby was found. Tips about Bob started coming in after people saw the news coverage about Gabby's case. And there's speculation that this death is somehow related to Gabby's murder. Of course, this is really speculative for the most part, but it's possible and I wanted to mention it. So then a few days later on September 30th, the FBI came to the laundry home and entered the home. Pretty much since the beginning of all this, there have been media outside of the laundry home constantly or just protesters, people watching what's happening. I mean, they've had eyes on this house 24 seven. So this was all recorded by the media and their attorney said that they were there to collect personal items of Brian for their canine search. And agents were seen on camera entering their camper on the property before leaving. Of course, they haven't released much more about this. Then on October 2nd, 53-year-old hiker Dennis Davis called 911 to report seeing Brian near the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina near the Tennessee border. Now this was actually Dog the Bounty Hunter's original theory when he first got involved in the case before he got the tip about Fort DeSoto campground. His original thoughts were that Brian could be in the Appalachian Mountains. I talked a bit more about this on my podcast, Mile Higher, but let me go ahead and play that original clip from Dog about why he thinks he could be in the Appalachian Mountains. You know, the strongest lead I see is that one of her friends said he had been in the Appalachian Mountains by himself for a couple months. Now, he's not just a camper then, he is a outdoorsman. So in order to do that, I think because of his age, he felt comfortable. If there's anywhere right now that looks the hottest, that could be the area. But it covers several states. So where did he go in at? That's where you start your tracking point. From right when he went into the mountain with dogs, They've got so much infrared. I mean, they're going to catch him. So when this tip came in on October 2nd, which was after Dog had talked about this theory, it was quite interesting to people. Here's the audio clip from the 911 call that came in from this witness who could have seen Brian. Hey, we're County 911. What's the location of your emergency? Well, I'm, I'm on the highway right now, but um, I, I ran into Brian Lauer just a little while ago. I was at the parking lot for the Appalachian Trail, the north side of, on Waterville Road. He was, he was driving a truck, and I stopped and spoke, talked to him. It was a white truck. I think it was a Ford F-150. I'm not 100% sure of that. And it was kind of a, a newer model. It wasn't like an old beater. It was a, a newer truck. And he came up behind me and he slowed down and kind of flashed his lights, like telling me, oh, go ahead and go and I'm going to wait for you. And as I turned around and I'm coming back by him, he's waving his arm out of, out of his truck, like for me to slow down. And I pull up next to him. He was, he was talking wild. He, to he said that his girlfriend loved him and he had to go out to California to see her. And he was asking me how to get to California. And I said, well, you can get on I-40 right there and drive west and you'll get there. And he said, no, I think I can go this way and kind of left. But he was acting funny. And I wasn't sure about what he looked like. And then I got, I went and parked and pull, pulled up the photographs of him. And I'm 99.99% sure that was him. The man who called in said that this person he saw seemed mentally shot and that something was wrong. When I started talking with the gentleman, um, I could tell right away there that um, he wasn't, something wasn't right with him. He also said that he tried to give this man directions, but the man wanted to only use back roads. 
Hmm. He ended up reaching out to Dog the Bounty Hunter with this tip, and his daughter, Lisa, provided him with an audio sample of Brian's voice. And after listening to the sample of Brian's voice, Dennis said, There is no doubt in my mind I spoke to Brian Laundry. None whatsoever. I'm absolutely 100% sure that was the guy. My heart was thumping. I'm telling you, this was the guy. Two deputies were immediately sent to the area to search for Brian. Dennis also told the media that he did an interview with the FBI, which was 45 minutes long, and told them everything he knew. And on the same day that all of this came out and the 911 calls were released, the FBI did confirm that they were looking into multiple sightings of Brian Laundry along the Appalachian Trail. The Hayward County Sheriff's Office has reportedly received at least 10 recent calls related to the Brian Laundry search. And still, as of today, Brian is not considered a suspect in Gabby's murder. He is only considered a person of interest due to lack of evidence. And so far, there have been no confirmed sightings of Brian Laundry, just a lot of possible sightings. Also, since I last recorded, we got a lot more of the body cam footage from Moab. I showed a lot of it in my last video, but even more was released and it's even more upsetting. The Moab City Police Department ended up releasing more body cam footage from Officer Eric Pratt, who responded to the reports of domestic violence between Gabby and Brian on August 12th. Again, just as I said last time, this footage is upsetting. Seeing Gabby like this is incredibly hard to watch. Just seeing how distressed she was, how overwhelmed and scared she clearly was. And there was a lot of question before about what officers actually knew at this point, what had been reported back to them from dispatch about the witnesses who had called in reporting domestic violence. And a lot of the questions are slowly starting to clear up. So first of all, in the footage, we see Officer Pratt approaching the van and speaking with Brian. And he said, we got a call about a male hitting a female. How's it going? How are you doing? Good. Hey, we got a call about a male hitting a female and the two of them getting in this vehicle and taking off. So I, it was, I, I, I just, I don't want to try and defend myself by saying anything here, but I pushed her away. She, she gets really worked up. And when she does, she swings and she had her cell phone in her hand, so I was just trying to push her away. But from this point on, it became clear that Officer Pratt did everything he could to minimize and defend Brian's behaviors. Then we see the officer walking away from Brian and going to talk with Gabby. He had asked for her side of the story, and as a little recap, she gave him her version of events. She said that she had been stressed that morning trying to get work done on her blog. She said that she has OCD and can sometimes have a mean attitude, even though she's not trying to be mean. I was just really stressed this morning trying to get a lot of work done, and I was apologizing to him on the I had thrown a bunch of stuff in the back and all our bags are back then. I was just apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry that I get so stressed out because I have OCD and I was just like organizing stuff. And sometimes I just have a mean attitude, but I'm not trying to be mean about just straightening things up and stuff. So she explains in the clip that she was trying to apologize to Brian. I was just apologizing, but I guess I said it in like a mean tone and he got really frustrated with me and he walked me out of the car and told me to go take a breather. She explains that she didn't want to take a breather because she already felt like she was calm. She explained that all she wanted to do was get on the road and fill her water because she was really thirsty. But I didn't want to take a breather because I wanted to get going. We're, we're out of water. So it kind of made you more upset. <laughs> yeah, it didn't help calm you. It made you more upset. Yeah. She then talks about how she wanted to sit in the van and keep working. And even though Brian was taking his own walk, he wouldn't let her in. So what happened after he locked you out? Until you take a breather. Well, he walked away to go take his own breather, and, but I wanted to sit in the car because there was all my stuff was in the car. I had no yeah. one of my bag. And I, had to, I was working on something at the moment in the car, and he told me to just relax for a second, and I, I didn't want to relax, so I got, got really mad. And, I mean, I don't need to be mad. Yeah, what happens? Then what happened? I and, then, and then I told him to drive with at this point, we see Officer Pratt make a comment about a mark on Gabby's face. Yeah, is there something on your cheek here? Looks like did, did you get did you get hit in the face? Um, kind of looks like something like hit you in the face. At this point, Gabby kind of hesitated 
and then the officer also pointed out a bruise on her arm. And then over on your arm, your shoulder, right here, there's, that's new, huh? It's kind of a new mark. Oh yeah, I don't know. Can I see the other side of your face? So, what happened here and here? Um, I, I'm not sure. At some point you can hear her mumble something about her backpack, and Officer Pratt ended up saying, so the backpack got you. He's trying to get in the back of the car and his backpack is on the back. Got me. So the backpack got gotcha? you? He asked about her injuries and she hesitated and stumbled over her words. She was clearly incredibly nervous. As many of you know, victims of trauma need more time to process what they have been through. They also need additional time to process questions and answers because oftentimes they're afraid that their answers could put them into more danger. Officer Pratt then said that two people had seen Brian hit her and then Gabby said, to be honest, I hit him first because he told me to shut up. And she said she felt frustrated because she continually took the blame for everything. There's two people saying that they saw him punch you with just independent witnesses by Moonflower. Well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. Um, Where'd you hit him? I slapped him in the face. You, you slapped him first? And then what, just on his face? And he just told me to shut up. How many times did you slap Bravo, him? Romeo, India, Alpha. Couple. And then what? And his reaction was to do what? Okay, yeah, so he just grabbed you. So Gabby did admit that Brian hit her, but she also added that she had hit him. She showed Officer Pratt how Brian had grabbed her face forcefully, but he didn't punch her or hit her. But she explained that the reason she had the cut on her cheek was because Brian had grabbed her face and dug in with his nail. At this point in the video, she said she definitely has a cut on her face. She can feel it and it burns. There's been a lot of frustration over this. And at this point it's unclear, but for some reason, Officer Pratt took Gabby's slaps on Brian as aggressive but Brian grabbing her face hard enough to cut her skin with his nail as defensive. Did he hit you though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him and then I, I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Oh, I guess, you know, I guess, yeah, but I hit him first. Where did he hit you? Don't, don't worry, just well, be he, honest. He like, grabbed my face, like, I guess. Uh -huh. um, he didn't like, hit me in the face, like, he didn't like, punch me in the face or anything. Did he slap but, your face or what? Well, like he like grabbed me like with his nail, and I guess that's why it looks. I definitely have a cut right here because I can feel it. Yeah. Like, it's touching it burns. But. Uh, yeah. Okay. They go on to discuss Brian's driving, which Gabby also took the blame for. So has he been drinking? No, we don't drink. Okay. What was up with his driving? I this officer said he hit a curb. I I I. <laughs> While you're driving? Well, he was driving. Well, he was driving, you were hitting him? Well, not a lot, but yeah. But that was distracting him while he's driving? Are you not, only for like a second, but only because I saw him, I saw the like come on and I like kind of like... <laughs> Did you already tell him all this? I didn't get that far into okay, it. She, so was, she was hyperventilating She's saying that they don't, they don't drink, but at the point when you lit them up... You don't drink or anything. I, she started I was, hitting yeah, him. I was yelling at him, and then when and you turned your lights on, I like kind of punched his arm, like there's a... She's she saying was why he hit the curb. And at that point, Officer Robbins, who was the one to pull them over, got involved in the conversation. Gabby starts telling officers about her anxiety, Brian's anxiety as well. And she said that she doesn't take any medications, which they later did confirm with Brian, but they never asked if Brian takes any medication. Do you, do you have um, medication for anxiety you take or anything? <laughs> no. you do you take any medication for any? I just do yoga and Try to meditate stuff, but you tend to have a lot of anxiety and stress. <laughs> I have a lot of anxiety. Then we can hear Officer Pratt trying to relate to Gabby, talking about his previous relationships. He explained that his current partner helps with his anxiety, while his ex only made it worse. You know, I have anxiety too, and you know, my girlfriend, uh, my girlfriend's really, really calm, and she has a way of taking my anxiety and bringing it down. But my ex-wife. That's why she's my ex-wife. I'm just sharing, I know it's a little personal, but to help you understand, we would feed off each other's anxiety and it would spiral. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter how much I loved her. It may be a bad for your soul. Just saying. I'm not telling you what to do with your life, but if you know you have anxiety, look at the 
Look at the situations you can get in. You know what I mean? Then Officer Pratt walks back over to Brian. They're separated at this point so that they can get each side of the story. And he tells Brian to move into the shade. He was standing in the sun so that they could talk. They then talked about Brian's injuries. And Officer Pratt told Brian that Gabby had marks on her too. Yeah. And this gentleman noticed that you had some marks on your on your neck. Yeah. And she's got some marks on her too. So we're just trying to figure out what all happened. And I then... Officer Pratt left the conversation with Brian to go get water for Gabby, who was very thirsty at this point. Then he told the other female officer who eventually ended up at the scene that she could go talk to Gabby. And he specifically added that she seems like a really sweet girl. Then Officer Pratt, as I discussed last time, said that he believed Gabby was the full on aggressor here. Then the female officer confirmed that this is what Brian said too. From what she's claiming, she's the full on aggressor here. Uh, that's kind of what he would say. I'd love to go talk to the independent witnesses and maybe that's what I'll go do. Okay. Then Officer Pratt left to talk to an independent witness. He only got one on the phone who wasn't the person who called 911 originally. But the witness ended up telling Officer Pratt that the male was trying to grab the female's phone and confirmed that he had locked her out of the van, that he got into the driver's side and wouldn't let her in. And as a reminder, this van belonged to Gabby. He did confirm that he saw Gabby hitting Brian back and that in his words, it looked like children fighting. He said that something about this interaction just seemed wrong. And she was trying to get into the van and he said something about why are you being so mean, something like that. And um, I, I remember she sort of hit him um, a few times and it wasn't like slugs in the face, but just kind of like, like kind of like two kids kind of fighting. They, they reminded me of very secure, I don't know, <laughs> children sort of fighting. Um, but there seemed like something was off and it like a weird vibe. Officer Pratt then asked if he saw the male hitting the female. The witness hesitated, but then said that he did see the male push the female, but he did not see him hit her or punch her. As Officer Pratt continued to question, he asked the witness if this was a defense move by the male. The witness said he couldn't confirm if it was aggressive or defensive, but he said that it seemed kind of light. He said that they were almost laughing and that the whole interaction was very strange. Did you ever see the male strike the female? I would say that I think I saw maybe a push or a shove, but not like a full on punch to the face or anything. Was the shove or push an aggression towards her or was it a defensive maneuver away from her or to get her away from him. It was unclear what was going on. It seemed like he was trying to close off the passenger side of the vehicle and close things up. It almost seemed like he put that backpack or something on the back of the vehicle, I'm not sure. And then he was stepping in and she was out trying to get in. So maybe, okay. Uh, I, I don't, it was, the whole thing was off. And, and so, no, I didn't see anything that was like him taking after her or hitting her or, or vice versa. There was a very, there was, it, it was kind of light and they were almost kind of laughing and I wasn't sure if they were just joking around, to be honest, but then it got more strange as he was in the vehicle about to drive off. So Officer Pratt then confirmed that the female was slapping the male, but based on this conversation, it was obvious that this witness didn't think Gabby was an aggressor necessarily. So then he went and talked to Officer Robbins and explain the situation from the witness's point of view, but very differently than how the witness had actually explained it to him. Officer Pratt said that according to the witness, Gabby was clawing through the driver's side door. However, the witness never said anything like this. Then he started saying that Brian was clearly trying to disengage from her. He actually misquoted the witness saying, I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or a defense against her as far as her being the aggressor. But it's clear that the witness never said this and he never concluded anything about Gabby being the aggressor. He just reported what he saw. However, Officer Pratt still concluded that Gabby was the primary aggressor. He said, that he never saw the male strike the female. He saw the male trying to lock her out of the vehicle. She even told us that he was trying to lock her out, told her to go take a walk, so that she was trying to get in. She eventually couldn't get in and actually clawed her way in through the driver's door. He says, I don't understand why she's doing that. Well, I think it's because it was the only door that 
with a walk that she could get through. She's trying to get an overhead. He's trying to disengage from her. I guess he hung her backpack on the back, probably, so she'd have her shit, so that he didn't have to engage with her. Everything she's saying is the same thing. I haven't heard what he said, but if that's what he said, it's also what the witness is saying. The witness says, I never saw him hit her. I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or a defense against her, as far as her, you know, being the aggressor. So at this point, from what, unless the guy's screaming that he needs to go to jail and did something to this girl, it sounds to me like she is the primary aggressor. Yeah. There seemed to be so much focus on who was the primary aggressor or who struck first that the officers failed to consider who was the dominant aggressor or which one of them posed a greater potential threat to the other, which is most important to figure out. Also in the new footage, we see that Officer Pratt went to talk to Gabby and even joked around with her a little, saying that he was going to, quote, speak frankly to her because he has a daughter around her same age. So, look, I'm gonna speak to you frankly. I have a daughter almost your age. He then tells her that he was looking at her not as a suspect, but as kind of the victim because she was struggling emotionally and mentally due to the angst of her age. Yeah. And I'm looking at you not so much like a suspect, but also as kind of a victim in the sense that you're dealing with some struggles emotionally and mentally at your age probably they'll work themselves out as you get older. There's a lot of angst at your age, and I remember being your age too. Then he kind of scolded her for not being able to control herself, which according to him is what made her a victim, not Brian hurting her emotionally or physically, which we know he did both. The stuff you did today that, that contributed to this, because you both contributed to this, uh, is as a result of your inability to cope with the anxiety and the stress that you're having. So in a way, you're kind of a victim of this. Um, I think you would have done better if you had the skills to do better. But you don't learn skills until you learn skills. And you're not, you don't have enough life experience yet to know how to navigate everything. He explained that while he and the other officers sympathize with her, Brian had marks on him, which witnesses had confirmed that Gabby was slapping him in the face. We sympathize with you, but based on what you've said and based on what our, vic our witnesses said, and even based on what your, your fiance has mentioned, trying his very hardest not to have you in any trouble, he does have marks on him that witnesses say were caused by you slapping him. And that even you say you slapped him and, and were aggressing him first. It didn't seem to matter much that Brian had also hurt her back and cut her face. And then he actually continued to defend Brian more, saying that the reason he had to lock her out of the van was to get space from her. And I don't have anyone saying that he actually punched you aggressively. It sounds like it was shoving in a manner that was probably more consistent with trying to prevent you from entering the van or to get space from you, not to ass assail you. Then he starts talking to her about assault laws in Utah. And he actually said that these laws were made because, quote, too many cops have made bad decisions in these situations, which is ironic because that is what he was currently doing. He explained once again to her that she was the primary aggressor and that they had no choice but to separate them for the night. And neither of them wanted to press charges against each other. They didn't want anyone to go to jail, so the best they could do was separate them, and Brian would be staying in a hotel under a domestic violence program. She will get to stay in the van for the night, and she will also be getting a court date. So they take Brian for his free night at the hotel, and Gabby is left to stay alone in her van. Gabby started to cry and asked if this had happened because a witness had said something. And then Officer Pratt ended up telling her that they had spoken to two witnesses, which was a flat out lie. We think there's two witnesses. And then there's what you said and what he said, and guess what, it all matches nicely that, that you were the primary aggressor and that the injuries he has were caused by your aggression towards him. Even if he doesn't feel hurt, even if he doesn't want to press charges, there's nothing any cop can do about it. It's written into the law. Turns out at this point, he hadn't even talked to the witness who had actually made the first 911 call saying that the male was slapping a female. Officer Pratt continued to defend Brian and their decision, even as 
Gabby is begging to not be separated from him because she can't handle being alone for the night. She pleaded with him to just give her a ticket instead. I don't, I don't want to be separated. <laughs> you going to have anxiety? Yeah, yeah no more team, please. <laughs> There's not? What is it? No, like, we're a team, please. I'm gonna, it's going to give me so much anxiety. Can we just have like, a, a driving ticket? Hey, the, the very best thing I can do is call my supervisor and see if I'm missing something here. <laughs> because if we can, I'll, I'll pay you any driving ticket, a parking ticket, anything. Okay, Gabby, if that'd be Gabby better, try to calm down and I'm going to go call a supervisor. But I don't think that there's much I can do, but let me see if the supervisor can tell me something I'm missing to make this not happen. I can't feel right and I can't, I can't handle that, I'm sorry. Okay. And on the call with his supervisor, we can hear him say, quote, a tiny little girl slapped her fiance several times and that he had a tiny abrasion on his jaw. But he mentions nothing about the mark on Gabby's face that was painful and stinging. Hey, so a tiny little girl, 22 years old, slapped her boyfriend, her fiance, several times. He's got a little bit of a, a little tiny abrasion on his on his chin, on his jaw. He said again to his supervisor that this was according to two witnesses, which was not true, and that it was also corroborated by Gabby and Brian, but he's leaving out tons of other details. His version was that Gabby pissed Brian off. He said that she was having a rough day and Brian was simply trying to separate from her. And then he said, she won't stay away from him. She was pissed off, she's having a rough day. He tries to separate from her. She's not staying away from him. She has severe anxiety problems. He talks about how she had severe anxiety problems and that Brian had only locked her out of the van that she owned so that she could cool off. He locks her out of the van says you need to go for a walk and cool off. And then again he says that Gabby had clawed at Brian to try to get in the van. She's forcing her way into the van. She's clawing her way past him into the van to be with him. He's shoving her to get her out of the van, but he's not assaulting her or he's not assailing her. He's trying to keep her out. She's punching, slapping everything. And then he had the nerve to say that this girl was only 105 pounds soaking wet and that he thought she was really struggling with the idea of being alone. She's got to be 105 pounds soaking wet, 22, full of anxiety, having a really tough time. And then he basically asked the supervisor what can be done under the law for this situation. At the end of the call, Officer Pratt decided to reread the statue because the spirit of the law is being lost on this one. I'm going to go reread the statue and just see if, if it fits or if there's a way it doesn't fit. And if I can find a way that, because it, it really is, this the spirit of the law is being lost on this one. It really is. Officer Robbins then comes over to the window of the car and went over the statue with Officer Pratt and they discuss their options. Officer Pratt is then heard saying, according to the Utah Code for Assault, assault is an attempt with unlawful force or violence to do bodily injury to another. And all of the officers spent time talking about whether Gabby fit this definition, but seemed to completely ignore the idea that Brian could also fit the definition, especially since one of the witnesses claimed to have seen Brian slapping her and there was a mark on Gabby's face. There was a bruise on her as well. Officer Pratt started talking about how the definition for bodily injury is physical pain, illness, or any impairment of physical condition. Officer Robin started to describe Brian's injuries saying that he had a swollen right eye, which was actually the first mention of this injury as far as we know. Officer Pratt interrupted him and then continues to go on about intent. He said that what matters is intent, not the results. It seemed like they never even considered if it was possible that Brian meant to cause Gabby physical pain. And then Officer Pratt actually said, It's because too many times women who are at risk want to go back to their abuser. They just wanted him to stop and they don't want to have to be separated. They don't want him charged. They don't want him to go to jail. And then they end up getting worse and worse uh, treatment and then they end up getting killed. Wow. That is upsetting to hear. 
considering what happened. He then said he can't imagine Brian will end up being a battered man, but he added that he doesn't know for sure because he doesn't have a crystal ball. But there was no mention at all, no discussion around the idea that Gabby could be the victim and that she could end up being killed. So in the footage, you can hear them decide that they have to find out if Gabby was the one trying to cause bodily injury when she hit Brian. And they said that her answer would, quote, seal her fate. Was it her intention to do him bodily injury? Now, that's what we have to find out. What was her intent? What was her intention? If you go ask her, what was your intention when you were slapping him? And she says, uh, I wanted him to hurt or be ill or impair his physical condition. Then there's nothing we can do. One way to word it might be, hey, when you slapped him, were you attempting to cause him pain or an impairment of physical condition? Whatever she answers to that question will seal her fate. Because the only way you know her att- or what she was attempting to do is by asking her. Right. In the end, Officer Pratt left the final decision up to Officer Robbins. After this, he ended up leaving the scene. None of the officers really questioned Brian much about his behavior, you know, locking Gabby out of her van, which was her home, which she owned. And officers actually just assumed that the van belonged to Brian. They didn't even ask and clarify, but they just made that assumption and actually asked him at one point if he trusts Gabby with his van. There was no concern over Gabby being locked out, especially in the heat in Moab, the fact that she was so thirsty when they got to her, none of that was a concern. They also never talked to him about how he had taken her cell phone away from her. And this was her only way to contact family and friends. You'd think it'd be a major concern. And they never asked Brian at all about the mark that he had left on her face, the cut, or the bruise that she had gotten from him as well. Plus going back to when they were originally pulled over, Brian had claimed that Gabby had grabbed the wheel. There's been a lot of question over this, but they never followed up with Gabby about this claim Brian had made about her grabbing the wheel when she had firmly denied it. It seemed like they had excuses for all of Brian's behavior and just twisted everything Gabby said to make her look like the aggressor. I mean, the officers confirmed that Brian had pushed Gabby, grabbed her face, cut her cheek, grabbed her arm, and left bruises on her arms, took her phone, and locked her outside of her van. But since Gabby wouldn't say that he slapped her, they said that she was the primary aggressor. And he was the victim. Now, days before this second round of body camera footage was released, the Moab City Police Chief, Brad Edge, requested a leave of absence, which started on Monday, September 27th. And at this point, the footage from the female officer's body cam has not been released, even though the media has been requesting it. But this second round of footage says a lot. And I definitely want to know what you guys think about all of it. So now let's go over some other new developments. There have been several recent developments that have changed the timeline of the case. Dog the Bounty Hunter ended up receiving a tip that Cassie Laundrie, Brian's sister, was in Fort DeSoto Park on September 6th, which contradicted her previous statements to ABC News that she had not seen him at all since he was back. I haven't been able to talk to him. I wish I could talk to him. I've cooperated every way that I can. I wish I had information or I would give more. I, I, this is all I have is I, I gave to the police. Cassie claims that her parents allegedly are keeping her in the dark for the most part. And their family attorney ended up releasing a statement that Cassie Laundrie had seen her brother twice since he had returned to Florida. He said that he stopped by her home with his parents on September 1st, and they drove the Mustang. Cassie and her family had also visited the Fort DeSoto Park on September 6th and spent a few hours with Roberta, Chris, and Brian. And during the visit, apparently Cassie had never asked Brian about Gabby, which just feels so strange. Cassie did another interview on October 5th and released a bit more information. She said that Brian had flown back to Florida without Gabby on August 17th. Cassie said she saw Brian during this visit and that she and her kids also FaceTimed with Gabby. 
Their attorney has confirmed this trip, saying that Brian flew home from Salt Lake City on August 17th and flew back to meet Gabby on August 23rd. So this is only becoming more and more confusing. They've explained that the reason for this visit was for Brian to collect some of his personal items from back in Florida and that he was also there to close a storage unit so the two of them could save money and extend their trip a little longer. Cassie claims that the last time that she saw Brian was on September 6th. She said her and her family were in the Fort DeSoto Park from 2 to 8 p.m. and didn't notice anything unusual about Brian and their parents. But it seems very hard to believe that she wouldn't be asking about Gabby, especially if she cared about her so much. And she always talks about how much her kids loved Gabby. We just went for a couple of hours and we ate dinner and had s'mores around the campfire and left. And there was nothing peculiar about it. There was no feeling of grand goodbye. There was no nothing. I'm frustrated that in hindsight, I didn't pick up on anything. It was just a regular visit. I've been cooperating with the police since day one. I have been in touch with law enforcement. Cassie said that she wants her parents to cooperate. I don't know if my parents are involved. I think if they are, then they should come clean. She also said that after watching the newly released body cam footage, that it was normal for Gabby and Brian to argue and take space from each other at times, but she personally claims to have never witnessed anything that would suggest domestic violence. Cassie and her husband were also filmed answering questions from protesters outside of their home on October 4th. They actually went out there and talked with them, which was pretty surprising also because investigators advised that they don't do this because the protesters were upsetting their children. But they did anyway, and during the interview, Cassie confirmed that she saw Brian on September 1st with their parents, that they drove to her house in the Mustang, and at that time, she didn't know Gabby's van was back in Florida. She yeah. came to this house with my parents in their Mustang, not the van. I did not know that he took that van back. I found out the next day with everybody else. We are just as upset frustrated and heartbroken as everybody else. And I am losing my parents and my brother and my ch children's aunt and my future sister-in-law on top of this. She said that her parents had planned to pick up her children from school on September 1st and bring them home. But Cassie was surprised to see that Brian was with them. Cassie also clarified to the media about her original statement about not having seen Brian all of September. She explained that her answer was actually about not being able to talk to Brian about everything since September 11th, when Gabby was reported missing. The media ended up misconstruing what I said when they asked me if I had seen my brother. Like I said in the beginning, they didn't say, have you seen Brian? It was, what's the weirdest thing about this all? It was, you know, I haven't been able to speak to my brother. I tried to contact them after this. I tried to contact my family after this. I hadn't been able to speak to my brother. Cassie also explained that her parents have stopped speaking to her at this point because they were advised by their attorney to do so. She also went on to say that she feels that she has been thrown under the bus by her family and by their family attorney, Stephen Bertolino. She actually said that he really screwed her over. I don't think anyone would have ever came to your house no, until the media came happened. out and said, well, the she- The media yeah. said that and my parents' lawyer really screwed me over by saying that he just Well, I saw by. the comment that he, he made. He did not just stop by on the way home and I was livid and I'm not speaking to anybody. Yeah, no. I'm done because that put me in danger. That made my kids find out this horrible way with questions. Yep. We were waiting until there was some kind of closure so the kids were just sad instead of sad, worried, and now really scared of you guys. Finally, in this interview with protesters, she clarified that she had not ignored any calls from Gabby's family, which had been kind of going around. She said that she never got calls from them actually, and it, that they possibly could have been contacting her at a wrong number. After this, the protesters actually thanked her and they promised that they wouldn't be back. Gabby's parents and step-parents have also spoken out in an exclusive interview on The Dr. Phil Show. It aired in two parts on October 5th and 6th. I can't include any of that as I've explained many times. Dr. Phil is very strict on the copyright front, but they did end up revealing a bit more information about where Gabby's body was found. Her stepfather, Jim Schmidt, said that he traveled to Wyoming while Gabby was missing, and her family believed that this is where she'd be found and wanted to have someone there. They said the area that she was found had remnants 
evidence of a campfire next to a small clearing where a tent had likely been pitched, and Gabby's remains were located just in front of this clearing, about a five minute walk from where the van was parked and captured by those YouTubers. Jim explained that he saw the area for himself, which I'm sure was incredibly emotional. He actually ended up leaving a stone cross as a memorial to Gabby. The family has also said that they believe Chris and Roberta Laundrie know more than they are sharing. They also confirmed that the two of them never responded to any of the panicked texts and calls when Gabby's family was trying to contact them to get answers about where Gabby could be when she was still missing. They also revealed that when this all first started happening, they actually thought Brian and Gabby were missing and they were concerned for both of them. But after they reported Gabby missing, they were informed by police that Brian was in Florida with Gabby's van, but without Gabby. Gabby's family has said that they believe that Brian is still out there, that he's alive, and they're hoping that Maybe eventually he'll just turn himself in. And at this point, this search has gone on for a long time. It's almost been a month that they have been searching the Carlton Reserve. There's been a lot of questions over whether Brian could even survive out there this long. So the abandoned vehicle incident report for Brian's Mustang that he allegedly drove to the Carlton Reserve was released on Wednesday, October 6th. And according to the report, the vehicle was ticketed at 2.42 p.m. on September 14th. However, most of the information in the incident report has been redacted. Meanwhile, the Carlton Reserve is still closed to the public. The search appeared to be kind of scaling back at the start of October, but it really started to ramp back up after a reported discovery of a campsite. That day, there was a huge increase in activity at the reserve. Recently on October 6, the Laundrie family attorney confirmed that law enforcement had asked Chris Laundrie, Brian's father, to assist in the search efforts at the Carlton Reserve. There's been a lot of question over this. Why are they just bringing him in now? Why wasn't he immediately searching from the beginning? But media captured Chris leaving their residence on October 7th, and he drove out to the reserve in his truck. He was then picked up by an all-terrain vehicle and a member of law enforcement and was driven into the woods to help search. Of course, the media found the vehicle at the reserve and determined that Chris and the officer continued on foot into the woods. According to media, law enforcement has asked Chris Laundrie to come out to the reserve to help view the campsite that they found to see if it looked similar to how Brian would set up camp. Chris left the reserve around 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon and drove home. Law enforcement did remain at the reserve searching. However, there were less vehicles there on October 7th than October 6th but it appeared to be a very targeted search. Like they had narrowed down a possible location that Brian could have been or might be. But a lot of people have been skeptical about the Carlton Reserve altogether. I've seen interviews of neighbors who say they're constantly there, that they you know, normally ride bikes there every morning, walk their dogs there, and that they just don't believe he's there. But who really knows? I mean, with how long they have been searching there, the amount of resources and money that has been poured into searching the Carlton Reserve, I mean, we've got to hope that they've got reason, more reason than they are telling us to believe he really was there or is there. They haven't really spent much time searching the Fort DeSoto campground at all. The Laundry family attorney also released a statement saying that Chris had showed members of law enforcement some trails and other areas where Brian may have hiked, like some favorite spots. These places were well known to Brian, so they kind of need the insight from Chris, but it's hard to say how honest he's really being. Also, I've been seeing a lot of questions around the Laundry family, what they could be held accountable for, possibly charged with. And I don't know how to answer a lot of those questions, honestly. So I wanted to include an interview with Jennifer Coffin-Daffer, who is a former FBI agent. She did this interview with News Nation and Brian Enton. Almost 30 years in the FBI, right? Close to? 25, 28 in federal law. 28 years, okay. Do you feel Brian will be found alive soon? I believe Brian will be found alive. I don't believe it will be soon. I just believe he's going to be able to hide in his surroundings. I think he's a learned outdoorsman and survivalist. And I think because of that, he's going to be able to 
stay out of law enforcement's grasp for a while. Is there anything the FBI can do to put more pressure on the parents to talk? Well, I think one thing that needs to be done is we need to put pressure on Cassie to talk. I think Cassie wants to talk. I think Cassie would talk in the right environment. And I think once she talks, I think the pressure and the heat heats up on the laundries. Do you think Cassie is telling the truth? There are so many things she's not telling the truth about. Uh, the thing I think she's telling the truth about is she's angry that people are out front and they're upsetting her children. And I think she's very angry that the laundry attorney dropped her in the grease and exposed that she was on that trip. I think that's what she's telling the truth about. Other than that, I give her an F for telling the truth. You give her an F. Wow. Pretty much. I think she might know about the troubled relationship that they had, even though she said she doesn't know anything about it. Uh, it just seems to me that she's going to have that information because they lived with Petito and Laundry. Do you think Brian's parents are still in contact with him? Yes, although very loosely through the attorney. Because the, the attorney, I guess, can do that. Yeah, he has you know. attorney-client privilege as long as he doesn't do anything in furtherance of any crime. Could the laundries potentially face charges? Absolutely. They could potentially face charges. Aiding and abetting, possibly harboring, depending on exactly how this plays out, what did they know, when, and so forth. Um, but the other thing is, were they involved in any way with any destruction of property, any cleaning, anything like that, that could speak to accessory after the crime and they could be charged with that. Someone's asking, what kind of personality do you think Brian has to be, he was acting so normal after Gabby went missing? If, if Cassie's telling the truth that he was just acting normal at the camp, the camp out, like nothing was wrong. Well, I have to say, I don't believe Cassie. I don't think they were just sitting around roasting s'mores and having a little lemonade and hot dogs for dinner. I think that at that campsite, they discussed what happened. I think they discussed what they were going to do moving forward. And they discussed the exact details of how they would deal with this situation. And I believe that because why did they need to leave this house? I think they were concerned about FBI surveillance, about FBI overhears, about their calls being monitored, and they wanted to go someplace secluded so they could truly talk this out. Then recently, on October 8th, an officer from the Northport Police Department told the media that so far nothing has been found at the reserve to indicate that Brian has ever been there other than his Mustang being parked outside of it and ticketed on September 14th. This is coming from Northport Police Department, though, not the FBI. It's possible that they have information that Northport Police don't have. And then we find out that the reports of a possible campsite that they found and maybe some of Brian's belongings was completely false. However, officers have acknowledged that the authorities are keeping some of the details of the investigation away from the public at this point. When they were asked if Brian had been under surveillance when he disappeared, the officer responded that they were doing all that they could under the law with the facts that they have. Law enforcement says that they will continue to search for Brian as long as they need to until they find him or until they get answers about what happened to him. And of course, this could be a very long time. I mean, this could go on for a while. I can't believe how long it's gone on. Officers said at this point, they think it's about a 50-50 chance that they will find him alive. I'm recording this on a Sunday night. I've been looking all weekend and it looks like they are still searching the Carlton Reserve. As far as we know, Chris has not been back to the reserve at this point and the FBI is still seeking information from the public about this case. So of course, 
Anyone with information should call 1-800-CALL-FBI. And any photos can be uploaded at fbi.gov slash petito. Dog's daughter, Lisa Chapman, also tweeted out a series of pictures showing unique features of Brian's to help the public identify him. Other people have created and posted photoshopped images of Brian with different hairstyles or older pictures with a different haircut or style of facial hair. Because obviously if he is on the run, and if he's smart, he's probably trying to change his appearance as much as he can since he is one of the most well-known faces in America right now. Also, a forensic artist created sketches of what Brian could look like if he changed his appearance, shaved his face, or lost weight. If you want to think of him not shaving, then he's so easily recognizable. He has like super distinctive facial hair. It's incredibly distinctive. So if I were him, I would shave. But if he shaves, he looks more different as a shaved man, way different than when he's wearing facial hair. The number one item that I found criminals use for a disguise is a ball cap. So there's a ball cap, and then I have ball cap, and I have sunglasses, hello. The second most popular is to have sunglasses. Northport police also said in an interview recently with Brian Enton from News Nation that police are working to figure out how Brian Laundry vanished and that no investigation is perfect. They confirmed again that nothing related to Brian has been found in the swamp and they are now calling the circumstances around the parents' story a lot of oddness. You know, no investigation's perfect. Was he under surveillance? I mean, did you have eyes on him? What I'll say to that is that we were doing everything within the law that we could with the facts and the circumstances that were at that time. Do you have any idea how he got away? Uh, what I'll say is that uh, that is a consistent, uh, something that we're working to figure out. As far as how we got away, I, I don't even know how to answer that. Well, what I mean is, you know, if he was staying with his parents at the house and I was out there, there were a lot of police outside the house a lot, didn't you, a lot of the why time. Why didn't you see him? I, I didn't see him and I was out there. Police were out there. I mean, we've heard stories. Could he have gone out a back door? Could he have, you know, run through a y- yard? I mean, do you yeah. have any idea? Yeah. Um, no. I, I think certainly what the family has told us is that he drove out to the park and walked out into the woods. I think that is certainly on the table. Do you believe the family at this point? Is there reason to not believe them? At this point, everything that I've learned and we figured out is is I don't know necessarily what to believe anymore. Um, I think it's certainly possible that they're expressing what they know, Um, but we'll see. I mean, this is an ongoing investigation that will continue to evolve. And, uh, you know, I think you saw yesterday the, the family was out there helping in the search. I think. You know, it's a sign of them trying to work with investigators. So I hope that is, uh, you know, the beginning to, to maybe more of what they know. Also this week, some neighbors of the laundries hammered this sign into the laundry's front yard. It says, remember me, Gabby Petito, Roberta and Chris, I once lived with you. And it has a big picture of Gabby. And just as a reminder, I'm sure most of you understand this. The FBI wants to make it clear that if you see Brian Laundry or think you see Brian Laundry to call the FBI call 911 immediately. Do not hesitate, even if you're not completely sure. And please, the last thing that you need to do if you see someone that you think is Brian Laundry is film them and then go post it to the internet because that does literally nothing to help. If you actually think you see this man, report it right away. It's incredibly important and time sensitive. Okay, so I am recording this update portion of the video on October 12th. I wanted to include this information even though it came out after I initially recorded this video because it's very important. And just a warning, this information could definitely be triggering to some. Today, 10-12, there was a press conference with Teton County Coroner Dr. Brent Blue, and he confirmed that Gabby Petito died of strangulation. After a detailed investigation by our forensic pathologists, our anthropologists, and local law enforcement, uh, with assistance from the FBI, the Teton County Coroner Office is following the following verdict in the death of Gabrielle Lenora Petito. We hereby find the cause and manner of death to be the cause death by strangulation and manner is homicide. By Wyoming state statute, no other information will be released about the autopsy. The only thing that is released 
in the state of Wyoming is cause and manner of death. Also was confirmed that Gabby was not pregnant. That's been a rumor that has been going around pretty much since the beginning of all of this. And he also said they are estimating that Gabby died three to four weeks before the body was found. As far as the uh, time of death, uh, we are estimating three to four weeks from the time that uh, the body was found. I can't imagine how hard it was for her family to receive this news. I'm not sure when they actually found out about it. Having an image in your head of how this played out is so incredibly devastating to think about, and I can't imagine how they are feeling. After the coroner's announcement, Laundry family attorney Steve Bertolino released this statement. Gabby Petito's death at such a young age is a tragedy. While Brian Laundry is currently charged with the unauthorized use of a debit card belonging to Gabby, Brian is only considered a person of interest in relation to Gabby Petito's demise. At this time, Brian is still missing, and when he is located, we will address the pending fraud charge against him. And in response to the Laundry family attorney's statement, Gabby's mom said tonight that his words are guarded. Garbage. You just have to imagine uh, what Gabby's family must be going through right now, learning uh, about her cause of death. But that's what we know as of 2 p.m. Mountain Time on October 12th. I will put any additional major updates that come out in a pinned comment below. Also today, Northport, Florida City crews boxed up the Gabby Petito Memorial that's grown over the last month near City Hall. A more permanent memorial is in the planning stages, and all of these cards, candles, and stuffed animals will be taken to Gabby's family. I don't know when I will be making my next update on this case. It depends on what happens next. I mean, we could be kind of at a standstill for a little while. It seems like media coverage has slowed down a lot. Of course, with the FBI leading the case for the most part, they're going to release very minimal information. And things are going to come out over the next months, the next couple of years. I mean, this will likely go on for a while before we fully understand it all. Also, before I go, I did see a tweet from Lisa Chapman today, an update kind of on where dog's at. And I wanted to share it with you. She said, hi guys, I was locked out of Twitter due to account security, just got back in. A lot of people have been asking about my last tweet, which she had mentioned having big news. And I've been asked not to share active information due to the large amount of media surrounding the case. So who knows what they have at this point or if they have anything, we just don't know. She also posted an image that says, I know I disappear a lot. I don't text back consistently and I'm distance. The truth is I'm a superhero. She also followed up this tweet saying that her dad, Dog the Bounty Hunter, is headed back to Colorado temporarily to handle some business. She said, remember, he was in Florida on his honeymoon. We are still actively searching for Brian Laundrie, leaving a team in place in Florida. As always, whatever I can share, I will. She also followed this up saying, not giving up 100. It's common that we include you all, put so much heat on a fugitive, they dig down, he will pop up again. Bait is set. I also saw an interesting reply to this from someone named Jim Johnson, who said that they have 20 people up here in Boone, North Carolina, and some from Tennessee Line going out and staying on the look for BL on the Appalachian Trail and surrounding areas. If we do catch him, we will donate the reward to Justice for Gabby Foundation or give it to her parents. Someone else named Florida Girl followed up and said, be mindful of the law. Citizen arrests are not legal in North Carolina. Just wanted to make sure he can't charge you with anything. Most importantly, stay safe. We don't know if he's armed or if he would be willing to harm others to get away. Also, I did want to mention that the Gabby Petito Foundation has been tweeting a lot about trying to get Gabby's YouTube channel, Nomadic Static, to a million subscribers so that she can get a play button, which was always her dream. So if you have the time, please go check that out. Go subscribe. That would be really cool for their family. So the manhunt continues. And all we can do at this point is hope that eventually Brian Laundry is found alive and that Gabby's family can get the justice that they deserve. I'm definitely curious about what all of you think. Do you think Brian is going to be found? Is he going to be found dead or alive in your opinion? I mean, none of us know at this point, so we can only make guesses. I want to know what you guys think about where he could be hiding if he is out there. Do you think it's more likely he's in Fort DeSoto? Do you think he could be in the Carlton Reserve still? Do you think he's 
out of Florida completely and maybe in the Appalachian Mountains? Do you think he's somewhere else? I'd love to hear all of your thoughts below. Let's just all hope that this guy is brought in alive so that justice can be served for Gabby Petito's murder. But that is going to be it for me this week, you guys. I will be back soon with another video. I'll see you guys then, but until next time, stay safe out there. Thank you.